but a one in three shot of getting him to the next round and cooking against the chef. I want to be there so bad. I've got to nail this dish. Josh Daniel. This is a totally new dish for me, so it's a little bit of a risk undercooking the pasta and hoping that it cooks in the oven. I won't even know if it is cooked until the judges taste it. Yum, Sam, that looks amazing. So good. Get it in the oven, Sam. It's pretty identity at the moment. Probably a bit under, to be honest, so I need to get in there. A bit more heat going through it. Yeah, fingers crossed it comes out perfect, but we'll see. Let's go, guys. Come on, Daniel. Come on, Sam. Whisk it like you mean it. I'm so hungry. I want my cheese sauce to be thick and luxurious, but not too thick. You know, I think the worst thing about mac and cheese is if it's all one texture. Mmm. Cheesy. Have you tasted your chilli yet, Tamara? Looks really good. You know, chilli and cheese go brilliantly together, but I also want to put some beautiful crispy prosciutto into that mac and cheese today. I want some saltiness to balance with that beautiful cheese sauce and that spice from that chilli. Let's go, Tamara. With about eight minutes to go, I strain off the pasta, also add my fried off leeks and asparagus. Also add a little bit of extra goat's cheese on top and it's time to pop it in the oven. Take my mac and cheese bake, sprinkle on my little poor man's parmesan or my crunchy bits, straight back in the oven. Another five or six minutes if I can push it and it should be ready. You've only got five minutes to go, make every minute count. Come on! Keep pushing, guys. Come on. Come on, Tamara. Push, push. How does it taste, Ham? Mmm. Good. Nice and spicy. It's good. Woo. I really want to make this look like the Hong Kong style dish that I've been inspired by, and I want it to look beautiful on the plate. Out of the oven. Come on, Samuel. No time to waste. Two minutes to go. Come on. I grab the pasta out of the oven. I pop it into a small bowl. Come on, Ben. Egg yolk sits on top, and I just start to add shards of crispy chicken skin. Hey, get that chicken skin on, Ben. Come on, Daniel, let's go, let's go. I'm using every single minute of this 45-minute cook to get this pasta cooked through. I don't want a chewy pasta. Come on, Daniel. I need every second I got in there. Ten seconds. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. That's it. Your time's up. Well done, guys. I'm glad you Oh, it looks really good. Well done. Wow, a fast and furious cook in round one to test your metal. And we're hoping we're going to get three brilliant versions of mac and cheese. I'm getting a little hungry. But remember what's at stake. You want to get into round two to win that immunity pin. So, first up to taste, tomorrow. <laughs> So, tomorrow, what have you cooked? I've cooked a super-sized chilli mac and cheese. The presentation is kind of inspired by Chong Fan, which is a rice noodle dish from Hong Kong. It's a great idea. Come on, let's taste. It's actually a really nice dish. I quite like the, the combination of flavours. Thank you. Mm. You know, we wanted creamy, and you certainly delivered that mass of cheese in that bechamel. That idea of wanting to reference a, a Chinese dish in terms of pairing chilli and pork is a great combination. I think it's playful. I think it's mouth-watering. I think it has all the stuff we want in mac and cheese in terms of creaminess and crunchiness. I love 99% of it.
but to be honest, it's really chili sauce heavy. Interesting, Tamara. Thank you. Thank you. Ben, you're next. Ben, what have you created? I've done a chicken and leek mac and cheese with a softly poached egg yolk to emulsify it and then also some crispy chicken skin. Is it a mac and cheese or is it chicken carbonara? That would be my question. By having the egg yolk and dressing it, do you take it into carbonara? I know they're very similar. Maybe we should mix it together. The idea of chicken, leek, asparagus, it makes sense, but it feels like a pasta dish. It needs to be a little lighter. I'd love the sauce to be looser. I'd like it to be a little more cheesy to make me think straight away mac and cheese. There's an idea there, but I think you could have been braver. Yeah. Mm. Thanks, Ben. Interesting. Samuel. <laughs> Samuel, what's the dish? Uh, this is my cauliflower and cheese macaroni bake with a little gremolata and poor man's parmesan on top. How's that pasta cooked? Um, hopefully perfectly. I underdid it a little bit in the boil and then finished it in the oven. Look, I found myself going back for a second and third spoonful because it's predictable, it's familiar, it's a clever and nice way to cook, and I, I like that. I think that you stuck to the brief really well, but still had that twist. Yeah. And I think you should be commended on that. I love the crunch. I love the fact that when you're eating it, you're thinking silky, creamy, dairy. And that cauliflower sauce in the liquidizer was brilliant, but that was a perfect texture right there but you bait and so it's left it a little bit thick for me good well done, Samuel. Great, Samuel. so today I've cooked whiting with pickled beetroot and halloumi cigars there's fried halloumi as well and horseradish greens do you, do you want to dress it or you have yeah your... absolutely. what's the sauce so it's a reduced fish stock with the bones of the actual whiting. Looks beautiful. I love the fact that you've championed the halloumi by making a very clever cannelloni with the beetroot. I think it's absolutely brilliant. I think you cook the fish beautifully. Uh, I love the little crispy crumbed halloumi. This stock, that is a proper sauce. Mm. That, that, that gives me goosebumps. <laughs> that is smashing. Thank you. So you may well have found a, a new classic combination, you know, tomato and basil. Whiting and halloumi. That is a great cooking. Two in a row, Sarah. <laughs> well done. Woo! Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm feeling ecstatic. I could be top three today. <laughs> Eloise. Walking the dish up to the judges, and I have so many nerves. I'm the one that selected this ingredient, and I just don't want to stuff it up.
And what, what have you done? Um, so I've got a halloumi tasting board for you. So there's halloumi in the shortbread, the halloumi in the fritters, there's fresh halloumi here, there's some pan-fried halloumi with currants there. Yes, Great. currants well. in a sherry reduction. I love the biscuits. I love the, the fried halloumi with this, you know, Pedro Jimenez and currant kind of sauce on this biscuit. Absolutely delicious. I, I'm not 100% behind the fritters. When you want them to be maybe crisp light with some gooey cheese in, they weren't. Maybe a little heavy. Yeah. I'm still unsure if I've done enough sour elimination today. <laughs> Next up. Tamara. I made halloumi and lemon macarons, sort of lemon curd in there. Inventive? Yeah. Wow. Next up, Trent. Uh, I cooked a smoked halloumi with some charred onions, uh, red wine reduction, and some crackers. Delicious, fresh, and it's a light smoke. Well done, Trent. Thank you. Benita, up you come. Polenta halloumi chips and a warm pippy salad. That's Awesome cooking, oh, Benita. Good, thank wow. you. Wow, you're finding your mojo, yeah. aren't you? <laughs> Jess. I've made you a Middle Eastern cheesecake. How bloody dangerous would they be if you had a box of those in the pantry? Yeah. Oh, very Maybe good. just call them my name. Gary. <laughs> Yum. Next up, Lee. As I'm walking up to the judges today, uh, I'm really disappointed. I'm not happy with the dish. It's not me, it's not what I cook. Uh, I did a baked halloumi, a uh, baked in phyllo with red peppers and char grilled courgettes. What a shame. When George and I came to your bench, what we wanted to do was, you know, ch channel your thinking. And we've got a very confused bowl of food there. And uh, the fact that the pastry's um, undercooked. And the shame of it is I thought, oh, that parcel will be crispy, and inside there'll be some little surprise. Right, that, I'm not even going to talk about the dish. You got great produce today, right? But your frame of mind wasn't there. OK. That dish. Not good. I know my dish wasn't good enough today. I'm not too proud of myself. Next up, Carly. So, Carly, what did you cook? Today I made cheesy sesame crusted fritters with a grapefruit and honey syrup. Do you want to pull that off? Yeah, or? sure. It looks unlike anything else we've seen today, and that's yeah. always a big plus. Different thinking. Stylish. Oh, oh my god, they're light. Yum. Yum, yum, yum. I looked at that and I was thinking it was going to be super sticky and honey, and it's actually a really light dish. I like that a lot. Good dish. It's, it, you know it's a good idea when you wouldn't have thought of it yourself. That's the way I look at it, and I go, I wouldn't, oh, well, I wouldn't yeah, have thought no, of that. Just true. Well done. Thank Thanks, you Carl. so much. Well done. Thanks. I'm just so elated, and I just wanted to push the boundaries today and really make myself stand out. <laughs> Next up, Ray. Make this one home for my family. Really hoping it's enough to get me over the line. Ray, what have you cooked? I've done a vegetable and halloumi stack. You happy? What I wanted to do was hear the halloumi and something that I would enjoy eating, so. Okay. All right. Tuck in. That is a big plate of food. 
So I've lost the halloumi completely. And what I would say to you is take the red peppers and the halloumi and think about that. Wring the neck out of it in terms of flavor. Okay. And you would have a dish that is 20 times better than that one. Take this idea, put it back into the 1980s cookbook it came from, never open that cookbook again. Okay. All right, thank you. So I'm putting the cheese on top of the carrot reduction. The idea with that is that when the judges take a spoonful, all the flavours are going to come together. Rather than having it poked on the other side of the plate, I want it to be easy to eat uh, with all the elements together. On the way in, I noticed the herb garden. Run, Maddie, run! <laughs> this time of year, there's flowers and shoots and everything's looking really beautiful, so I'm going to grab some flowers just to introduce those flavours without the heaviness of the hard herb. The plate's coming to my head now. I don't want the judges to have a big mouthful of mango. I just want them to have a nice slither, like a palate cleanser. Maddie and Rachel, you've got five minutes to go. Make sure you start plating up now if you haven't already. Everything has to be on the plate. Go! Do I leave it in the souffle thing or do I take it out? Are you going to put it back in the oven, Rachel? Yeah. I don't want this to flop. Double baking the souffle will allow it to stay firm and perky. Souffle is really difficult, but Rachel's looks great. I'm not worried about the souffle for it at all. It's just whether the flavour combination is going to work. Maybe it's a little bit too much fruit on the plate. Uh -uh. What's rustic about that, mate? <laughs> <laughs> You can't be rustic and use tweezers. <laughs> <laughs> Matt and Rachel, you've got two minutes to go. Lisa. Two minutes to go. <laughs> Those um, so beautiful. bread crumbs look awesome. Yeah, they're really just they like not dry, like crunchy, sort of chewy. buttery and yeah. chewy. And... Can you tuck this up, please? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> 10 second roll. Yes! Time's up. I've put up a beautiful dish. I really wish I could sit down and eat it. Oh, my gosh. It's no souffle. Having a look at Rachel's dish, I mean, the souffle looks really good. I take my hat off to her. I would never attempt a souffle under this sort of situation. She showed some good technique and skill in the kitchen. This dish is carrot and manchego salad. Carrots manchego, a great combination. Certainly, this is very pretty. This is very restauranty. There's lots of cheese, and it's very colourful. Yeah. Should we serve up? Let's do it. Yeah. Very pretty. Let's taste. Yeah. I like it. Certainly heroes the cheese, doesn't it? I love my chain, don't It's great. Well, we asked for the core ingredient to be all about cheese. This dish is all about cheese. Carrots, cheese, little <clears throat> breadcrumbs that have been toasted off. That lovely little soft curd is really delicious. It's a delicious dish. I think what I love most about it is the fact that it heroes the manchego and the crunch. And there's a little bit of softness in there with the curd. What do you think of the sauce, Matt? That, that little carrot sauce is, is delicious and it adds a, a, a bit of sweetness and acidity to the dish. But that's what I'm lacking. I'm getting a lot of salt. 
but I need with the with these fried crispy cheesy bits and with a lot of manchego, I need some acidity and I need some sweetness just to balance those those two together. Right, shall we score? Yeah. Well, that's plate one. Let's try plate two. Let's. This dish is twice cooked cheese souffle with lobster. Thank you. Well, mango lobster, um, you know, kind of very Californian. Cheese souffle and lobster. Not something I've seen before, but you know, lobster mornay is a is a kind of known dish. Look, I love the idea of a cheese souffle, and I love the idea of a twice baked cheese souffle. There's so many different versions. You know, you pop them out of the mould, you can refry them, you can simmer them back up like a souffle Swiss in cream, and that would really hero uh, a champion the cheese. But why the lobster? Why the mango? It seems um, an odd combination. One or other for me. Gentlemen. Lobster and mango works. Lobster and grilled mango is better. Mm. And the fact that whoever's cooked this has cooked the lobster really well, that's the plus on the dish. I really love it. But then putting cheese souffle next to it doesn't work. Unfortunately, when you put the mango, the cheese, and the lobster together, it ruins the cheese, it ruins the lobster, and it ruins the mango. It's just a shame, because you've got really two dishes here. You've got the lobster and mango with a bit of burnt butter, and we probably would have been happy. Yeah. Or you've got the cheese souffle with a little vinaigrette and we would have been happy but unfortunately we've got a combination of flavors that are just like they're a, they're a train wreck yes yeah, it doesn't work shall we score welcome to Simon Johnson which I thought would be a great place to have a masterclass because Simon Johnson has all these wonderful international and domestic farmhouse cheeses today we're just gonna look at the basics the different types of cheese and two recipes a baked clarines and a fondue from the Swiss Alps. Yum. The most important thing when it comes to understanding cheese is to understand that it is simply preserved milk. And when we talk about preserved milk, we, we put cheese into, into various categories. And we start with the very freshest categories, and we work all the way through to cheeses that are very hard and keep for a long time. It's really that simple. I actually pick out six categories. There's lots of different ways to do it. The first one is fresh cheese. Cheese that is very high in moisture, doesn't keep for a very long period of time. Can you think of any cheeses that would fit into that? Oh, the goat's curd. Uh, yeah, it's very good. Or maybe a mozzarella or something. Yeah, like that. that's right. I've got a little plate here of, of fresh cheeses. You've got the fresh goat's cheese here. You've got feta, OK? This is barrel-ripened feta. We've got halloumi, very ancient cheese going back, you know, a few thousand years. And we've got a mozzarella. And this is not just any old mozzarella. Guess what milk this is made from? Buffalo. Buffalo. Yay, that's it. <laughs> good, good, good. Would you like a try? I'd love to. OK, try that. Thank you. Tell me what you taste. Definitely quite salty. I think there's it's... kind of a, a bit of a sourness to it. Yeah, mossy, mossy, mm. mossy flavour. But that's fantastic when you put it with olive oil and tomatoes and stuff like that. The next category of cheeses, which is mould surfaced ripened cheese. You're talking about brie's and camembert's and all those sorts of cheeses. And essentially what happens is this mould on the outside is responsible for ripening the cheese over a period of time, somewhere between 45 and 60 days. And this cheese here is from the Alps on the French-Swiss border. And we're going to be cooking with this cheese a little bit later on, OK? So the next category of cheese is soft washed rind cheeses. And they're washed with a bacteria which goes bright orange, and it's called B linens. But the distinctive thing about these cheeses, apart from the fact that they tend to be orange, 
is they stink. Tell me what you smell. Remind you of that old school locker? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> um, uh, it's certainly got a, a fairly distinctive aroma to it. I, I would say feet. <laughs> hey, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the characteristic. And the more a cheese smells, often the better it tastes. So the next category of cheese that we're going to look at is blue cheese. The blue moulds are introduced as the cheese is made. It's then put on the shelf for maybe a month or two. And the cheesemaker puts a hole inside the cheese and the cheese starts to go blue. But the secret of all blue cheese is Penicillium Roqueforti mould, which was discovered in the caves of Roquefort over 2,000 years ago. And so when we talk about Roquefort being the granddaddy of all blue cheeses, it's one of the oldest cheeses known to man today. And it's a classic benchmark when it comes to judging blue cheese. So what do you think? I like that the mould gives the cheese that little bit of crunch and it adds a different texture dimension. It's got heaps of depth. And that's what yeah. you get with raw milk cheeses. Heaps and heaps of flavour. The next category of cheese is the most popular cheese in Australia. It's basically semi-hard cheeses, things like Edam, Gouda, and most importantly of all, Cheddar. Cheddar represents something like 65, 70% of all the cheese enjoyed in Australia. And a long, long time ago, most cheddar was made with a cloth on it, like this one here. And why cloth is important to recognising good cheddar, what it allows the cheese to do is gradually dry out. That allows the moisture out of the cheese, but it also allows the cheese to draw in fresh air. And that's very important when you want to create flavour. The last category of cheese, is what we call hard cooked cheese. And really what we're talking about is the big mountain cheeses, Gruyere Emmental. Those are cheeses where the curds are basically heated up so they shrink and then they're pressed very hard for a long period of time. So that means they keep a long, long time. And basically what that tells you about that category of cheese and about the whole preservation process is the more moisture left to the cheese, the shorter the time it'll keep for, and the less moisture kept in the cheese, the longer time it'll keep for. The other cheese that fits into this category is one of the greats of the cheese world. It's Parmigiano Reggiano, which is, of course, Parmesan. And you can always recognise that by this little dot mark on the outside, which says Parmigiano Reggiano. So, my top tips are, when it comes to buying cheese, Always try and taste it first. You're looking for flavour. The next tip, when it comes to serving cheese, take it out of the fridge at least three hours before you're going to serve it. Cover it with a damp cloth, and just before you serve it, take the damp cloth off the top, and you should have cheese at the optimum temperature. Well, guys, now we're going to get into our cheese cooking masterclass. I've got two really, really simple recipes for you. The first one is baked clarine. Now, clarines is a soft cheese. And you can see on the top here, it's got a mouldy rind across the top. So, the first step is to take some garlic. And I'm just going to take this clove and cut it into five pieces. Now, this garlic we're going to blanch. And to blanch it, quite simple, throw it into this pot, some boiling water, pour it over the top and leave it for a minute. The reason to blanch it is if you just put garlic straight into the cheese, you'd find it would be quite crunchy and very garlicky. Just drain this off. What we're going to do is we're going to make a little incision in the cheese and we're just going to pop the garlic in the hole like that. I keep going like that. See how easy it is? Mm -hmm. I learnt this recipe originally from a camembert recipe, believe it or not. But it works really, really well with this cheese. So once we've done that, got five pieces of garlic in the top. So I'll put this onto a baking tray. I've got some wine here. It doesn't really matter what wine you use. You can use red or white wine. So we're just going to pour that over the top of the cheese. Not too much. Look at that. 
and that'll slowly seep down into the cheese, flavouring it as it goes. And when we put it in the oven, it'll also keep the cheese moist. Then what we've got here is some thyme. Then the last step with this is just some pepper across the top. And then we pop it in the oven, 185 degrees, for about 20 minutes. But it's worth keeping an eye on because if it gets too hot, the cheese will just go everywhere and the box will burn. And look at that. What do you think? It's delicious. There's the smell of it when you're bringing it out of the oven. It was awesome. So, the moment of truth. Your turn to try it. it wasn't difficult to cook. Come and have a try. Can we just dunk some of the bread in? The way to do it, yeah, let's put some bread in. Now, stop pussyfooting around. Look, it's like this, OK? <laughs> OK? That's it, like that, you know? Watch it, it's pretty hot. What do you reckon? The rock your world? That's amazing. I think you could win people's hearts with that. Because <laughs> you, can, you can really taste everything that you put in as well, like, but nothing's overpowering. Like, there's just the garlic there and the, and the red wine and the thyme. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. What do you reckon? I think if you served it at a party, it'd kind of be one of those moments where the whole room would go quiet. Everyone would just be dipping in for the hot cheese. So I could see why it'd go down very well. So, top three tips for my baked clarines recipe. One, blanch the garlic. Two, use red or white wine and thyme. And three, don't leave it in the oven too long, because you can imagine what happens if the box burns and it goes everywhere. Simple. So guys, here's the next recipe. It goes back thousands of years to the Alps. Its name is fondue. And it's a perfect dish for those really cold winter days. And this dish actually began as a way of using up old cheese, leftover wine and stale bread. The starting point is this fondant pot here, piece of garlic. Very simply what we're going to do with this, crush it, like that, and then I'm just going to wipe that around the bowl. So we'll just drop that off. Now, this is our cooking implement. And the first thing we're going to put in here is 450 mils of white wine. Now, you can imagine people sitting around you know, a table doing this. And the first step is to sit there for the next five or six minutes, right, waiting for this to gently warm up until this starts to almost simmer. Not quite simmer, because you don't want the wine to start evaporating, but until it's fairly hot. Because otherwise, when you put the cheese in, it won't melt. So I've taken 800 grams of Comte and just grated it up. We're just going to add a couple of handfuls and let it melt in the bottom of the pan here. And the other most important thing about fondue is that it will burn unless you keep stirring it. So this is starting to melt nicely now. So I'm just going to add some more cheese. What you're looking for is a nice, smooth sauce that will coat the bread, but not something that's so skinny it just falls off, and not something so thick that when you put the bread in, it sort of sticks in there and you can't get it out. Cheesy bliss. Okay. OK, this looks almost done. So far, pretty easy. Take the bread. Now imagine you're doing this as a group. And everyone has a fork. OK, so what you do is you drop it in the fondue pot, figure of eight, because as this cheese mixture slowly depletes, what happens is that the, the tendency for it to burn will, will become greater the lower it drops. I'll give you that one. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Oops. <laughs> oh. What do you think? Hot? Beautiful. It's very strong cheese. I didn't expect mm. such a strong flavour, but that's absolutely gorgeous. One of the great things about food is sharing and just being around a table with friends and having a fondue pot, I think it's a great idea. It tastes good too. So the top three tips for fondue is one, start with good cheese. Can't make a good fondue without good cheese. Second tip is make sure that you stir it properly. And third tip, make sure you've got enough room for the last bite, because that's the best bit. Well, that's the end of my masterclass. I hope you've enjoyed it. Gary and George are waiting for you back in the kitchen. I wish you the very best of luck with the future. And before you go, I've got a little present for you.
Thank you so thanks, much. Yeah, thanks so much for today. I, I learned so much. So generous with your knowledge. We really, really appreciate it. Well, it's a real pleasure. Good luck. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Oh, how's it going? I'm actually going to make an open pie, like a sandwich. Ooh. And I've got rhubarb going on in there. Have you made anything like this before? I have never made anything like this oh. before. It's just a harebrained um, idea that I had. I do believe in what I'm trying to achieve in this competition. And as much as I've been caned for taking too many risks, I still believe in taking them. And what about your um, savoury pot? I've made a blue cheese. I'm going to make a pasty with four cheeses and it's just vegetables. Good luck, Poe. OK, thank you. I did feel extra nervous, even though I thought my pie definitely looked better than everyone's. Like, it's always down to the flavour and you just never know. It looks really pretty. The little crimps that you put around the edge are perfect, absolutely perfect. The filling's interesting. The reason why it's interesting is because that blue cheese gets in the way of something yeah. and it sort of confuses it a little bit. OK. You've taken the risk. I mean, I love blue cheese. I like it. Because I like blue cheese. I think your pastry's lovely. Um, your, the balance of everything is really good. So that wins for me. I really like it.